In Pit Lane is proudly brought to you by Dino Tech by Dino Dynamics. For your nearest workshop, visit our website. Well, hello everybody and welcome to a special edition of In Pit Lane. As you can see, we're not in the studio. We are, in fact, at uh, Brian Saylor's workshop here in outer suburban Melbourne. A couple of weeks ago, you would remember on the program, we announced the, uh, the passing of one of the legends of Australian motorsport, the great Frank Matic. Frank was probably underrated in Australia. A lot of people, you know, everyone remembers the name Jack Brabham, but uh, Frank was also not only a great driver, but also a great race car constructor and engineer as well. The man who was his chief engineer in the golden days of Formula 5000 is Derek Neller and Derek is with me today and Derek uh, first of all welcome uh, welcome here to back to Australia and also uh, can you uh, tell us about the relationship with Frank where did it start? Frank came over to England in 1969 to buy his first McLaren the M7 at uh, the M sorry the M10A I was working at McLaren's at the time. Um, Frank had put an advert in the um, Autosport in England looking for a, a mechanic engineer to come out to Australia. Um, I replied to that um, advert. He was staying with Don O'Sullivan in the Hilton in London and he invited me to bring my wife and come up to meet him and that was the first time I met him. Um, after an interview and a meal with him uh, a day or two later, he rang me and offered me the job to come out here with the with the car uh, and to start his um, career with in Formula 5000. Of course, Frank was legendary in in sports car racing. I mean, many people say in the days of the, in the 1960s, he virtually destroyed. Uh, big banger sports car racing in Australia with the with the SR3 and the SR4, um, but he was a real strong proponent of the Formula 5000 category in Australia because there was at times some discussion about going to the European Formula 2 instead. Um, what do you think was the attraction for Frank of Formula 5000, and why was he so keen to uh, to get behind it? Well, I I, I personally think it represented um, it was a step for him with the. It had a car that had a similar horsepower to his SR4. I, I'd read up about Frank before I, you know, contacted him, um, and I so I knew his um, career in sports car racing. Um, also in Can-Am, I was working at McLaren's at the time, and they were competing in the Can-Am. So, you know, talking to the mechanics over there, they, you know, there was a bit of history about Frank that I could refer to. Um, he was very passionate. Uh, the the 5000 category was suitable for Australia. Um, he took the gamble of buying the car, and um, before the uh, formula was uh, was actually um, ratified in this country, um, and I'm sure that he was one of the persons that actually pushed it forward. You mentioned the, that first car, that McLaren, that became a very famous car in and of itself. The interesting thing was most cars at that time in Formula 5000 were of course powered by Chev, but Frank was uh, an early adopter of the Repco Holden uh, engine. What was, that, uh, what was that decision about? Uh, why did he go that route? Well, when he bought the first M10, it was powered by a Chevy engine. And the first Tasman series we did in 1970, it was Chevy powered. Um, <clears throat> but he'd had this relationship with Repco, and Repco were developing the Holden engine. Frank was a great um, believer in Australian engineering, um, <clears throat> and one of my you know great memories of him. Um, everything wanted had to be done as much as possible in Australia. Um, he was a great um, how can I put it um, a great ambassador for, for Australian engineering. Um, and, and so he'd already cemented the um, uh, with, Ho uh, with Repco because he'd had Repco engines for quite a few years. And I think he was the leader in persuading Repco to actually build the, um, the Holden-based engine. 
Um, the engine was a little bit late, um, but I can recall in coming on stream, and that's why it wasn't ever fitted into the original M10A, and it first went into the M10B, um, which Frank got after the 1970 Tasman series. So he was quite successful with the with the McLaren, but at what point did he decide to move from the, the from the McLaren into constructing his own cars? Well, we got to the end of the development. What we could do with the M10, um, the M10B was um, developed extensively for Frank. Um, uh, Frank's car had 13-inch front suspension. It was the only car in the world, uh, the only McLaren in the world at the time with 13-inch um, front suspension and wheels. Being a Goodyear tyre contracted driver, he had the, um, the tyres available. Um, obviously, Goodyear had gone to 13-inch wheels in Formula One, and they made a suitable um, tyre um, uh, for the 5,000 cars, and we tried it on the, um, we converted the M10B to 13-inch wheels. And um, we got to the end of the development of the M10B chassis. And there again, and Frank wanted to buy, uh, build a car in Australia. He wanted to build his own car, i.e. like the, the SR4. And um, I think if, if he'd had, um, how can I say it? Um, he probably had a wish to build a car right from the word go, but he decided to um, buy a McLaren. Um, he had a very close relationship with Bruce McLaren and it was obvious way to go. Mm. So the first car was the uh, the Matic A50. Mm. Um, do you remember the, the the numbering of that car? Why the A50? Do you remember why that was? Yes, it was to do um, with uh, Repco's coming um, upcoming 50th anniversary. Oh. And it was a Formula A car, and it was 50 years of um, thing because in those days the Formula was either Formula A or Formula 5000, depending on which part of the world you were in. And, um, and the 50 came from the fact that it was in 1970, 72, um, it was Repco's 50th anniversary. And that's why it was done in honor of Repco. It was named in honor of mm. Repco. The car was very successful uh, first up and for, for many years. Uh, tell us about the development of the car and what, what, what were the highlights for, of your time with it, the things you remember? Well, obviously Frank, won the AGP first time out. The car was only finished on the, win uh, the Thursday before. It, it was dropped on the floor and wheel aligned on the Thursday. Um, it came out that weekend and it won the AGP first out, run ultra reliable. Um, I went home back to England after the, um, after the AGP for, uh, for a few months and I returned again after the Surface Paradise race in 1971. Frank had, uh, rang me and asked me to come back early and um, I came back. Um, he'd had a little bit of a torrid time in New Zealand with the car. Um, the car was still new. Um, came back, a, a few little modifications for Warwick Farm, and again, we went out. I'd arrived back on the Tuesday morning, and on the, that following weekend, we, we won a Warwick Farm. Frank was very good at developing a car. I can honestly say that the car probably never ran in the same speci exact specification more than once. You know, it was always being progressively modified and, and little things were being changed all the time. He was a fantastic test driver, very meticulous. Every lap was recorded. Every comment that he'd made on the car was recorded. Um, numerous test days um, and he would go around doing five laps at a time, come in one modification, one alteration at a time. Um, and uh, we might go in one direction and then come back again and then go off in another direction until he got the ultimate out of the car on the Pacific day. This car behind us, which is the original first car, chassis 001, um, we ran it right the way through from the AGP up to the end of the Tasman series in 1973 and it done probably more testing miles than it did racing miles. We were constantly testing. Frank was a good year contracted driver. He was responsible for the development of the tires as well for Goodyear. And we were constantly going to Warwick Farm and to Surface Paradise, testing, 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 testing. <laughs> and it was just interesting. He, he was really good um, in, in my mind 
he was good as, as McLaren, as good as Brabham. Um, one thing is that he built his own cars. I mean, Jack was a great engineer and a great driver, but Ron Toronac designed his cars and built them for him. Frank did his own. My earliest memories of my first ever motorsport event that I attended live was the 72 Tasman and back in those days people today would have no idea how, just how big Formula 5000 used to be back in those days. Huge crowds, international fields and of course the great rivalry back in those days was uh, I suppose Frank's sort of you know, compatriot or almost doppelganger from over the Tasman in Graham McRae. The, the Graham was creating his own cars and, and naming them after himself. Mm. He was uh, Graham had a, a was a very abrasive personality. He was very out there. They used to call him Cassius after Cassius Clay, and the rivalry was just big news. But how did the t those two guys actually get along? <laughs> I could never actually remember them actually probably having a conversation together. Yes, Graham. We called Graham Cassius because Graham was um, told everybody how good he was and he, he didn't lose the opportunity to tell you that he was the best and he was very good right he was there again I, I though I'd never worked for him or, or worked with him he was a very good test driver um, uh, he knew what he wanted and but as you said he was a bit of an abrasive character um, the relationship with him and Frank um, on a personal basis, I, I couldn't comment on because I never can remember them in um, in a conversation together. Uh, they we used to be quite a way apart. You know. The car was, of course, incredibly successful locally. Uh, you, you mentioned New Zealand with the Tasman series, but also Frank dabbled in some Formula 5000 racing in the United States in what was in the L&M series. It was a, mm -hmm. a, a major series. What what do you remember about those uh, about that campaign? Well, first of all, we went over in 1971 with the McLaren, the M10. We called it the M10C because we were on 13-inch wheel um, front suspension. And we won the first race at um, Riverside and then came second at Laguna Seca. Um, Frank had commitments back here because we were sponsored in Rothmans in those days, so we had to return. Um, in 1973, we went over again with two brand new cars, the A51s. Unfortunately for us, which was very unusual for Frank, the cars weren't tested over here. They were put together, um, I wouldn't say very late, but we arrived over there with two, at first at Riverside, two very competitive cars. Um, it, it much so that they created a rule in America called the Matic rule, because Frank qualified both cars, I think it was third on the grid, in both heats. And on the Sunday morning, they had to come up and ask Frank, which car he wanted to race. And Frank said, I'm going to race in both heats <laughs> and decide which car to use in the final. Um, they wouldn't have that, so we could only race one car. Um, as we progressed in, 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 into the American circuits, which were completely different in their layout and their, um, to, hit, to here, we found a slight problem with the engines. Um, we had an oiling problem with the engine, which was holding us back. We couldn't put in a number of laps or the, or the testing because of engine, um, this engine problem. And it wasn't quite successful as we hoped. Um, after Watkins Glen, which was the fifth race in the series, we, we returned with one car back to Sydney, back to our base. Um, and Frank had an idea what was wrong with the engine and um, we worked with Repco to cure that problem, which we did, um, and we built a car which we called the A52. The chassis, it was based on the same chassis, but we'd gone away from the front radiator concept to side radiators. Um, but things went um, not quite right with the sponsors in America, so we didn't actually return to America with that car. Um, we only raced it once in, in, um, in Australia, which was up at Surface Paradise, and Frank was in a commanding lead. I think he was. It was a, if I remember rightly, it was like a 57 lap round uh, race lap round um, Surface Paradise and we were on lap 52 and the um, battery collapsed. Uh, we were using a flat plane crank engine at the time. It was the first time we'd used it. Um, the, 
I mounted the battery in such a fashion that it was suffering from the vibration of the um, engine and it, it collapsed and, and Frank retired. That car was later written off at Warwick Farm on the test, testing accident by Bob Muir and we built up the last car of, of Frank's um, which was the A53 and as probably most people have been told, you know, Frank hadn't, um, we didn't do the first four races of the Tasman Series in New Zealand because uh, Frank's wife, Joan, was, um, wasn't very well. She'd had a back problem and she'd been in the hospital and had an operation. And Frank was a big family man. Um, one of the things that probably stopped him being a world motor racing star where everybody would have known about him, like Jack, was the fact that he was a family man and he'd sooner be here with his family than having to, to take them all around Europe and, and things like that. And anyway, Joan, um, uh, as I said, was ill and that prevented us doing the first couple races in New Zealand. Um, and just a couple days before the first race in Oran Park in the Sydney side of the Tasman Series, Frank got electrocuted on his boat um, and he couldn't race. Though he did practice on the Friday of the race to see if he could do the race but he felt that he couldn't um, he, he was quite comfortable in doing five or ten laps at a time around Oran Park mm. but the race was I think was going to be 70 laps and he mm. felt that he wouldn't be able to be able to manage that with the um, injuries that he had at the time and the car was given to, again to Bob Muir to drive for that race. The next Three, the remaining three races of the Tasman Series in 74, Frank competed in all of them. The first one at Surface Paradise, the next one was at Surface Paradise. Again, he, he was ba his hand was bandaged, um, but he came third to the two chevrons of um, Pallet and Gethin. The next race was at Sandown, which Frank led the race for the first 15 laps until the engine let us down with a water leak. And the last race, um, he led again the last race at Adelaide quite comfortably until he spun. And after the race, he, t he, he informed me that he'd been racing since the accident with a terrible headache. And I think the fact is that that was one of the reasons that he retired. He felt that he couldn't um, carry on anymore because he couldn't seem to concentrate 100% during a, a, a long race. And that was as a result of the electrocution? That was it? a result of the electrocution, yeah. He, he, he suffered quite badly, actually. I mean, uh, the, medicals, uh, the medics at the time said he was lucky to be alive. Um, uh, the, um, the, battery, the leads that he was holding at the time, the battery charging leads, which he'd mistakenly plugged into the wrong side of his little portable Honda generator, one had had um, clamped onto his hand and the other one had clamped onto his heart oh. and it um, and he fell over the battery that he was trying to charge and it, he had a quite a big burn and a lump burnt out of his chest and, a, and a also out of the fleshy part between your thumb and your first finger on your hand and it, it was quite a serious thing he was a lucky man to be alive you know, the fact is the engine stalled uh, that the generator mm. motor stalled, uh, that, um, and, and that before it actually killed him. Mm -hmm. So after his retirement, the the car that A fifty three, of course, did go on to have more success. It won it won an Australian Grand Prix here at Sandown in the hands of John Goss. Mm. Did Frank continue to have any involvement with the car after it was sold? Well, I can't comment on that because after Frank retired, um, I took the decision to return to England. Um, I felt that there was, um, I couldn't go and work for anybody else over here because they probably didn't have the commitment that Frank had to motor racing. And I had a slight family problem anyway, so I, I returned to England. I, I did follow the, the, um, the events that were happening in this country and he handed the, the, the car over to John Goss. I think he gave John quite a lot of advice and support at the beginning. And, um, but Frank actually walked I would say uh, walked away from from motorsport. He decided he was retiring, and, and that was it. And that was his at the end of that chapter of his life, and he had moved on to other things. You mentioned earlier we talked about the the Chev and versus the Repco Holden. The Chev was obviously the dominant motor right around. There were attempts at things like Dodgers and Fords, and what, but the Chev was always 
you know, the the engine to have. What was the main difference between the Repco Holden and the and the Chevy in terms of how they performed and their characteristics? The, the Repco Holden was lighter than the Chev. Um, it was about 20 pounds lighter from my recollection. It wasn't as powerful as the Chevrolet engine, uh, uh, you know, from the figures that we were we that were bandied around about what other people were getting in with their Chevrolet engines. Um, but I always believed that the Repco engine en engine horsepower was genuine horsepower. Um, the, the engine was very strong on its torque characteristics and uh, I've had quite a few um, drivers you know, tell, inform me that they thought that though we were saying that we only had 480 to 490 horsepower, they couldn't believe those figures because the engines were so strong. They pulled very well. Um, I can always remember Peter Gethin talking to me one day and he said, I, I just can't believe you've only got that amount of power when, you know, because of the way the, the, the engines pulled the car out of corners and, and things. It was a very nicely engineered engine. Everything was made by Repco. You know, I mean, it would have been, if you look in underneath the rocker cover of a Chevy engine, the parts you can buy off the shelf in a speed shop in, in, in America mm -hmm. and things like that. You look under the rocker cover of a Holden engine, it was all purpose made. The, the rockers were forged steel. Um, we had articulated push rods to stop the bending and the braking motions of it. it Phil Irvine was heavily involved in the development of the engine, was an absolutely brilliant engineer. And it was a beautifully made engine. Um, everything, all the castings were, you know, the, the manifolds were cast in magnesium, they wanted in aluminium. And it, it was a masterpiece of engineering using a stop block. Um, when we had the flat plane crank engines, which gave over 500 horsepower, it sounded just like a DFV Formula One engine on steroids. It was absolutely amazing. And I can remember the first time we used it at Watkins Glen, everybody wondered what we had in behind us. And um, again, Peter Gething came up to me and, and said, Derek, what are you using? Have you changed your engines? Mm -hmm. I said, no, it's just a mm -hmm. Repco Holden, but it's a flat plane crank. It, 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 they were very, very good. The very sound, what the sound was memorable when yeah. they when they announced that flat crank. Yeah. Everybody went to listen to it as much as watch it. Yesterday, I went out to see Darcy Russell, 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 yep, Russ, and he's got a Repco engine out there, and we took off the rocker covers, and so I could have a look, <laughs> and and it's just you know compared with the Chevy, it's it's just you know thing. Oh, it was just the bee's knees. The Australia, Australia's should be proud of what you know you have in, in the fact is that you had a company that could produce these winning engines. Frank was very proud that the, he was Australian and he produced a car like behind us that could compete with the best. The, uh, the other part of the world, England, where I come from, or America, and thing. And he was very, um, how can I put it, um, very pa patriotic. Uh, the fact is that this car was built. We had tubs built by CAC, all the casting was done by CAC, you hit down here in Melbourne, and, and so it was an Australian, complete Australian um, project. I, so with a lot of people, as I said, you probably don't know of Frank in the same way as they obviously know of, of, of Jack. For those people watching who you're younger race fans in Australia and around the world, if there was one thing that you, know, you could teach them, one memory that they should take out or thing they could learn about Frank Maddox, what would, what, what would it be? What would you say to them? Oh, um, oh, I don't know what I could say in one word, but he, he was an exceptional engineer, an exceptional driver, and Australia should be very proud that he was representing them. I was very proud and very honoured to work for him for the number of years that I worked for him. Um, he, to the point of when his son rang me and told me um, he'd passed away, the first thing I was doing was booking a flight to come from England to attend his funeral. There's, you know, that's what all I could do for him. He was a very good employee, employer, and um, he was also a very good friend to me. 
and um, as I said, I was honoured to know and honoured to work for him. Well, his legacy is uh, remains in cars like the one behind us, and there's, there's still a, quite a few of the, a few of the Maticas around. There weren't that many made, but we still have uh, still have a few of them. How many do we know? We've got this one that's behind us at the moment. The um, the A53 is uh, Chris Hocking has. Um, well, <laughs> there's this car, which is the original A50. Um, Yes, uh, over this weekend, I've been here for a few days, I've seen Frank's M10B, which um, Graham Wadsworth owned. Um, I've seen, um, well, uh, Aaron Lewis has the John Walker A50, which is now on its way to America. Um, I've, Chris Hocking has got the A53, which John Goss used to win the 1976 Grand Prix, as I believe, but I know it as an A51. Um, it was converted by Goss to A53 specifications. And yesterday I was at Darcy, um, Mr. Russell's. Ru Darcy Russell's um, premises and he's got the A53, which he's yeah. going to have restored back to its thing, um, back to its original condition. There's two other cars that were built and both of them uh, have been r completely written mm -hmm. off. As I said, the A52 was written off at um, Warwick Farm in 1973, and that's been destroyed. Um, it went to a um, scrapyard, and, and, and it's, it's completely destroyed. And there was a car that was sent to America, which Roy Woods Racing bought in 1971, which had a Ford engine in it, and George Falmer drove it in America. And that was written off in a trailer accident, and again, that chassis was completely scrapped, never to be rebuilt. Well, fascinating, uh, fascinating time in Australian motor racing history. You were a part of it. Um, we could sit here and talk all day about the, your, your career back uh, when you returned to England and prior to that. But uh, for the moment, Derek, thanks for joining us. Uh, sad circumstances to bring you back to Australia, but I hope you've enjoyed your, uh, your time here. And, and thank you very much for joining us in Pit Lane. Thank you. And I repeat again, it was an honour to work for Frank. And it was an honour to be here in Australia for the years. Frank was giving everybody, um, and if you call it entertainment, but it was representing Australia in, in, in motorsport. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for joining us wherever you are at the moment. Remember, if you would like to get uh, see more of these sorts of programs, drop us a line on our Facebook page. Also, uh, remember to subscribe to the In Pit Lane YouTube channel. But right now, from all of us here on In Pit Lane, until we see you again, thanks for joining us and bye for now. More power, better fuel economy, a cleaner, more efficient engine. They're just a few of the advantages of having your car tuned on a Dynotech dyno. To find your nearest Dynotech workshop, go to dyno.com.au. Dynotech by Dyno Dynamics.